subject, Molded by the Great Potter. Brother Mac, please. Just before we begin, I think it's very fitting to let you know that uh, here this afternoon there were 13 total that were baptized. Now that's encouraging because if you conclude the total that we had yesterday, that's 21 in total and certainly with the district convention being uh, so close, it shows that you're working hard in your ministry. We also want to mention too that commendation is in order because who sits for seven hours nowadays? And many of you are sitting for seven hours with children in your lap, a growl in your stomach and not sure what you're going to do later on this evening. And many of us are not only worried about what we're going to eat later on, we're going to worry, are we going to eat tomorrow? For many, you realize you're getting ready to start a new week, but the question is, can you endure this next week? So certainly we want you to know that the faithful and discreet slave, they appreciate you very much. They know your brothers and sisters are in the heat of the battle. What you're able to endure shows evidence that you're relying on our Heavenly Father. But if we look at our theme for our program, we are the clay and Jehovah is the potter. And yes, this afternoon we want to talk about allowing ourselves to be molded by the great potter. Actually, there's evidence all around that many today do not have appreciation for the value of life. But what do we mean by the value of life? Because evidence shows that people, they not only don't have value for their life, but they actually lack value for the life of others. But really, when we use the term value of life, we really need to stop and think about it. After all, the monetary value of the materials that constitute the human body is considered negligible. Why, one report estimated that at best, the materials that make up the human body, remember, it came from the dust. It came from clay. At best, they say it's worth about $21 nowadays. However, what added the value to our lives? Jehovah took these same basic elements found in the dust from the ground. He molded these elements into a complex structure and added the breath of life raising the value of the human body. So when we add Jehovah God to the equation, then there truly is value of life. However, now that we've established that there is value, here's a quote I'd like for you to listen to. The quote said, chance makes our parents, but choice makes our friends. Well, stop and think about that. Now that we've determined that our life has value, we really have very little choice in our genetic makeup and what our physical body really looks like. Let's face it, some of us will never be six foot five. Some of us will never be as short as we want to be. You know, some of us will never be as thin or as wide as we'd like to be. We have very little bit to do with our physical body. However, we do have a choice in how our spirituality may be shaped by Jehovah God, the great potter. Yes, as we consider our special assembly day program, it's been emphasized over and over again that Jehovah can shape us. He is the one that we should allow to mold us. Could you turn with me again to the book of Jeremiah chapter, chapter 18? We've turned there quite a bit. Uh, this day, but Jeremiah chapter 18, and let's read again verse 4. Here's a reminder from the Bible. And the vessel that he was making with the clay was spoiled by the potter's hand. And he turned back and went making it into a vessel, just as it looked right in the eyes of the potter to make. Well, this verse helps us to appreciate that Jehovah has the authority, like the potter, to make a vessel in whatever way he wants. Jehovah has that authority. 
That means that Jehovah can do whatever he wants to with us. He's molded entire nations before. So whatever he wants to do with us, he can do. But he won't. He will not arbitrarily mold us. He created us as free moral agents. That means he wants us to allow him. To submit to him in his work. Jehovah will never force us to do things against our will. We have a choice. We must choose to be molded by the great potter. As Brother Prifty so ably helped us to appreciate earlier today, our choices tell a lot about us. It's not the things that people make us to do, but what we choose to do. And that determines for Jehovah whether or not we want to stay in his hands. And the theme for our day, in Isaiah chapter 64 and verse 8, you might look at that. Isaiah chapter 64 and verse 8. As Brother Barrels helped us appreciate, this is a prayer. Isaiah is actually praying to Jehovah. And notice the prayerful attitude that he has. In the 64th chapter of Isaiah and verse 8, note the prayer. And now, O Jehovah, you are our father. We are the clay. And you are our potter. And all of us are the work of your hand. Well, is that really the way we feel? Can we actually say that we feel that we are right in the hands of Jehovah? Do we want to keep ourselves there? You see, to be useful to Jehovah, we must avoid certain attitudes that uh, make us no good for the potter. Such attitudes as, uh, well, no one tells me what to think. You ever heard that? Or others might say, well, no one tells me what to do. The fact of the matter is, you've already been influenced by others. People are actually telling you what to think, and they're actually telling you what to do. We all become pre-molded. We've already been shaped in some form, in some fashion, whether it's our background, our environment. Yes, our parents, we're already bent in a certain direction. And now Jehovah's saying, stay in my hands. I want to make you useful to me. I want to make you useful to my organization. I want you to be able to live, to live forever. Yes, we do have a choice, but actually, the choice is a very simple one. We have a choice to be molded by Jehovah, the great potter, or to be molded by someone else, and that is Satan, the devil. Whose hands do we want to remain in? You see, we all have gifts. We all have abilities. And it's interesting to note that those that are very gifted, those that have abilities, they usually want to use their gifts and their abilities for their own means. Maybe to gain fame and fortune. But how many will allow themselves to be used by Jehovah? How many will allow Jehovah God to determine how they use their gifts? That's what it means to be molded by Jehovah, to be useful to him. You see what the world wants to do? They want to use you up. And when they're finished with you, they want to spit you out. The world is filled with people that have been used up, squeezed. And now they're just part of the old dregs. We don't have to end up that way. We have eternal life in front of us. Grand blessings from our Heavenly Father that are so near at hand. So stay in the hands of the potter. Earlier this morning, we talked about what we don't want to do. And that is to be fashioned after the system of things. Now we want to talk about what we do want to happen to us. And that is to be molded by Jehovah. We're going to discuss three ways in which the great potter can mold us as his people. Now, number one, we're going to consider by his word is the way he molds us. He shapes us by his word. And notice what we're saying. It's, it's his word, not anyone else. That means we look at things from the Bible standpoint or from the standpoint of God. 
So he uses his word, the Bible, to shape us, to form us. Yes, to mold us. Number two, we're going to talk about his Holy Spirit. It's Jehovah's tool. It's his spirit. And by means of his Holy Spirit, that's the force behind the coming new order. So he can do whatever he wants by means of his tool, his Holy Spirit. Will we allow his spirit to shape us? And number three, Jehovah can mold us through his organization. It's his organization. You know, sometimes people, they have a problem with that. Because they can see imperfect people all throughout this organization. But it's his organization. If you see it, that means Jesus can see it. And that means Jehovah can see it. If they can live with it, why can't you? Stay in the hands of the potter. Allow Jehovah to mold you by means of his organization. All right, let's take the first one. Jehovah can mold us by means of his word, the Bible. Can we let God's word shape our thinking and our goals? Are you allowing Jehovah to fashion you by means of his word, the Bible? Turn with me to the 119th Psalm. And Psalm 119, there's a series of verses we want to consider. And as we do, uh, consider that Jehovah can shape our thinking, our actions, our outlook, our future endeavors by means of the Bible. And Psalm 119, look at verse 12. Here's what the psalmist tells us. Speaking of Jehovah, he said, bless you are, O Jehovah. Teach me your regulations. So Jehovah has regulations. There are rules. There are boundaries. There are lines. And that's how Jehovah molds us. He tells us to stay in line. Stay within the regulations. Stay within the boundaries. That's how he helps us. Look at verse 13. With my lips, I have declared all the judicial decisions of your mouth. So Jehovah is the great judge. The Bible says in the court took its seat and there were books that were open. So it's Jehovah's judicial decisions we're concerned with. We learn them through the pages of the Bible. In verse 14. In the way of your reminders. So that's what we need. We need to be reminded over and over again. The psalmist said in the way of your reminders I have exalted. Just as over all other valuable things. He's telling us that God's reminders are more than any other valuable things. He's saying we need to be reminded by you. Teach us Jehovah. Mold us and help us to be what you would have us to be. Isn't that beautiful? Look at verse 15. With your orders I will concern myself and I will look to your paths. So Jehovah gives us orders. He gives us direction. He tells us a certain path in which we should go. That's how he teaches us. You know, it's interesting. People will give more attention to the orders of man than they will of the orders of God. They'll follow the direction of man before they'll follow the direction of God. But those that are in the hands of the great potter, why they want God's word to shape them, to shape their thinking, to help them to set goals and ascertain what they should reach out for in life. And that's what the psalmist is telling us. And look at verse 16. The psalmist said, for your statutes, I shall show a fondness. I shall not forget your word. So the psalmist says, whatever you set, your laws, your statutes, whatever you mark, the psalmist said, I'm going to show a fondness for that. So this tells us that we should cherish God's word. We should hold it in high esteem of great value. How can you tell whether somebody is fond of something? How do you know whether they cherish something? Have you ever seen one that just cherishes their car? Well, how do you know? They're out there taking pictures of it, rubbing on it and everything. You can't come and put your hands on their car. They cherish their car. You know, some young ones, they, they cherish their toys, their belongings. They're looking at it all the time. They're trying to talk to you with the Game Boy. They cherish it. They'd bring it to the kingdom hall if they could. <laughs> because they cherish it. Do you walk with your Bible? 
Do you allow Jehovah's laws and regulations to set the path for you? So if we pay attention to God's word and the direction from the faithful and discreet slave, the counsel that we find, that's how we let Jehovah know that we want to be in his hands. Now, the inspired proverb recommends that we acquire heart. That's an interesting term. It tells us as mankind to acquire heart. Now, anyone here for the first time, if you're not familiar with that term, uh, here's what it actually means, to acquire heart. After all, you're sitting out there saying, well, I already have a heart. Some are saying, I have a sweetheart, but that's not what we're talking about. <laughs> to acquire heart. Now, first of all, the heart, when it's used in the Bible, it's it's the vast majority of the time it's referred to in a figurative sense. It's not referring to the muscle that pumps blood throughout our body and goes to the cells throughout our body. Uh, no, the vast majority of the times, uh, here's what's referred to when it says the heart. In the great majority of its occurrences in the scriptures, the word heart is used figuratively. It is the inner man or woman manifesting themselves in all of their ways in various activities. Now notice what's involved with the heart, the person that we really are. It's referring to us and our desires, our affections, our emotions, our passions. Have you noticed some people are very passionate about certain things? You ever seen someone who's passionate about sports? Some are passionate about golf and football and basketball. Some are passionate about shopping. Some are passionate about stamps and chocolate. Well, that's what makes us different because we don't all have the same passions. But that's really you. The person you are at heart. But there's more. It deals with a person's purposes. Their thoughts. Their perceptions. Now, that's what makes us different. The way we perceive things. Have you ever explained the same thing to two different people? You explain the same thing to two different people. One will get it and the other one never will. That's what makes us different because sometimes we just can't perceive it. And they're expl we're explaining the same thing to the same, for, to two different people. One will get it and one won't. That's what makes them different. It's a different person. It's a different heart. It's someone different inside. Not the outward appearance, but what we really are from within. That's the heart. But there's more. It says his imaginations, his wisdom, his knowledge, his skill, his beliefs, his reasoning. Now, isn't that what makes us different? We don't all reason the same, do we? You know, when I first learned the truth, I thought everyone in my family was going to just be so happy. I ran home to tell my brothers. They looked at me like I was crazy. They don't reason the same way that I do. We're raised up in the same household by the same parents. But that's what makes us different. We don't all reason the same. The person you really are at heart, that's who you are. That's how you reason. But there's more. His memory, now we're in trouble. Now let's face it. There are scriptures we want to remember and we can't remember them. There are scenes from a movie we want to forget and we can't forget it. We're in trouble. <laughs> but you saw the movie. That's what made you you. Everyone else doesn't have that memory. You see what the Bible refers to at heart? It's who we are deep down inside. Our very consciousness. So the Bible says, acquire heart. It's saying all of these things we just discussed... Can you line them up with God's thinking? Can you line them up with God's purpose? Can you put your heart in tune? Your memory, your mind, your wisdom, your skill. Will you look forward to developing skill that will allow you in such a way to go out and help others to learn about God? So allow God to mold our desires, our affections, our goals. Align our hearts with God's thinking. That's what it means to acquire heart. We get that by means of God's word, the Bible. It affects our goals, our outlook on life. In order to do this, it takes study and it takes meditation. 
We have to study God's word, the message that's found there in the Bible. And we must meditate upon it. You see, when we study, why we, we clearly see the picture. We, we take time and we, we can see the picture. The Bible is a mirror. And all when we look at the Bible, don't we see ourselves? When we look at God's word, we can clearly see who we are. But when you meditate, oh, that's different. Now, when you meditate, you not only see the picture, but you see yourself in the picture. And after all, when's the last time you knew someone got a set of pictures developed and you were in them? Last time they came to you and said, you know, I got my pictures out and we know we're in them. We said, well, let me see them. Who's the first person we look for? <laughs> we don't want them to know we're so vain. We try to pretend we're looking at them. You know, you look good here, but we know who we're looking at. <laughs> we like this modern technology. We say, send them to me by email. That way we can study them under the lights in the privacy of our home. We look at it and say, you know, I didn't look too good that day. <laughs> we say, I'm, I'm never going to wear that again. Well, God's word, the Bible, shows us up for exactly what we are. Do you stop and meditate on his word? Get God's view of matters. That's what we're being encouraged to do. That's how Jehovah molds us, by means of his word, the Bible. Our minds are transformed then. We learn God's will. Above anything else, we will begin to say, Jehovah, it's not what I want. But it's what you want. I'm not going to use my gifts just for myself. But whatever you want to do with me. You let me know. That affects our goals. When Jesus was at his weakest ebb. His back was against a wall. He had nowhere to turn but to his heavenly father. He said, Father, if you can remove this cup, remove it. But he said... Not what I will. I want to do what you will. We have freedom. Our back's not on the wall. Are we willing to tell Jehovah, Jehovah, it's not what I want. But let your will take place. This affects our goals. It certainly affects our outlook in life. You see, when Bible principles govern our conduct, not law, but principles, that means we've studied God's word, we've meditated upon it, we've captured the principle and not the law. It's interesting, people can do anything as long as you give them a law. We'll stop at a stop sign because we know it's the law. Now let's face it, some of us are just easing and then we move right on. But it's a law. Because we know there's sanctions, we say, well, I better stop. We make it a law. But based on God's principles, would you stop? Would you stop if it was just based on principle of the matter? No blood guilt. You don't want to hurt anyone. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Would you go out in the field ministry if we didn't count any time? Would you get 70 hours if we didn't put you on a pedestal and give you accolades and send you to school and seminars and say, well, that's a pioneer. What would you do if we didn't count any time? Based on God's principles, would you be a moral person if you never read that you're supposed to be moral? Are we in the hands of the potter? Jehovah's teaching us by his word, his regulations. He wants us to understand the principle. The more we understand the principle, the more we understand the latitude that we have in our service. The Pharisees knew the law, but they didn't know the principle. Jesus knew the law and he knew the principle. He knew the woman with the flow of blood. He knew there was latitude. So by God's orders, his reminders, his regulations, his word, the Bible, the publications of the faithful and discreet slave, that's how he teaches us. Yes, we're able to look at things from the standpoint of God. Do you look at things from the way Jehovah views them? From his vantage point? This exhortation takes on greater meaning that we should go out and preach. We should try to help others to understand God's values and his view. This moves us to set goals to have a fuller share in the ministry. Are we ordering our lives in such a way that we can do more in the ministry? Or are we just simply trying to do just enough to get by? 
Are we looking for ways and opportunities to do more? Could you turn with me, please, to the book of Matthew, chapter 9? Here in the Bible, uh, the book of Matthew, chapter 9, it's uh, really referring to Jesus Christ. But when we think about the time period in which we live in, we live in terrible times, hard to reckon with. The Bible says they're critical times. In Matthew, chapter 9, let's read verse 36 through 38. It's referring to Jesus. It says, on seeing the crowds, he felt pity for them because they were skinned and thrown about like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, yes, the harvest is great, but the workers are few. Therefore, beg the master of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. Do you feel that way? Jesus said the people were so bad off, he felt pity. They were skinned and thrown about. Now, American writer Horace Walpole, here's what he said. The world is a comedy to those who think, but for those who feel, the world is a tragedy. That's the way Jesus was. He didn't just think, he felt. And the world was a tragedy. Is that the way we feel? Do we want to... Order our lives in such a way that we can go out and help others, to talk to others. That's how Jehovah keeps us on track, by means of the ministry, by means of his word. We recognize that we can do the work that Jesus did. We can follow in the footsteps of Christ. So let God's word shape our thinking. Let God's word influence our goals. Cherish the Bible. Hold it in high esteem and value. Submit to God's will. Live by Bible principles. And Jehovah can shape us. He can form us into a vessel that's useful to him. And we'll be able to live as long as God lives. Let's look at the second area. The second way that God molds us. Remember we mentioned Holy Spirit, his tool? Well, Holy Spirit molds us as we endure trials. Yes, it's God's tool. And let's face it, a carpenter, he can't build a house without his tools. So Jehovah, he can't mold us without the use of his Holy Spirit. And my, don't we all have to endure trials. We're going through trials and tribulations right now. Oh, if you only had a minute each to come up here, you'd, you'd, you'd tell us a few things, wouldn't you? Why, just to make it to this program today, you have some stories to tell. But you made it. You survived. Some of you are sitting there, you're sleepy right now, but you're trying to hold on. <laughs> you're trying to hold on. And during sleep nowadays, that's a trial. Aren't we always tired? We go to work and we're tired. We come home and we're tired. We sit in our easy chair and we're tired. We're just tired of being tired. But guess what? You're still going to be tired. That's the system that we live in. The human heart wasn't designed to endure the things we've had to endure. We don't know how bad we've been affected by all of this. We're just surviving on pills and prayers. That's the only way most of us are making it. We're making our pills and prayers right now. That's the only way we're making it. But yet, Jehovah says, I have a tool. He allows us to have his Holy Spirit. Now, when it comes to trials, here's something that we should consider. Look at the book of James, chapter 1. And actually, we want to see, is this humanly possible? Now, the Bible writer, James, he made the statement, but we need to look at this closely. In the book of James, chapter 1. Here's what James had to say. In James chapter 1, we want to draw your attention, yes, to, to verse 2. James chapter 1 and verse 2. James said, consider it all joy, my brothers, when you meet with various trials. Isn't that strange? Now, I don't know anyone who's going through trials and they're just so joyful. They're just so happy. They're walking around telling people, you know, like the man who lowered his cholesterol. Well, I lowered my cholesterol. We don't know anyone getting in elevators and walking down the street. Hey, I'm going through trials. Isn't this fun? The trials are fun, aren't they? Now, who's doing that? 
But James said, oh, if you have God's view, if you're in the hands of the great potter, James said, consider the joy when you meet with various trials. It won't be just one. They're trial by number. It'll be a series, various trials. Now, why would we consider that a joy? When we undergo trials, our Heavenly Father is trying to tell us, I love you. I want you to live forever. I want to use you. I want you to be useful to my organization. But I just need to mold you. Isn't that good to know? Jehovah sees something in us. Jehovah trains all of his soldiers. And he finishes his training. So Jehovah will bring something around. And if we don't get it, Jehovah will bring it back again. And then if we don't get it, he'll bring it back again. And finally when we get it, Jehovah says, now you got it. Let's move on to something else. <laughs> but Jehovah is telling us, I want you to live forever. So let me shape you. Let me mold you. So James said, that's why we consider it a joy. When you're going through trials, think of what the trial does for you. It produces endurance. Consider the part that the trial plays in the molding process. Remember, don't be trapped in a web of bitterness and resentment. Everyone's going through trials. Have you suffered the loss of a loved one? We miss them so bad. Have you suffered the loss of a loved one? Isn't that a trial? People sit up and read scriptures, but now you know what it really means. You feel like you have a hole in your chest. But Jehovah says, just, just stay in my hands. Just let me mold you. Have you ever had a child that was severely disciplined so much that they read their name off in the congregation? You know how embarrassing that is? Isn't that a trial? You know how that feels? They read your children's name off publicly. Maybe they read your mate's name off. A family member. Now you're embarrassed. People say, amen, come, Lord Jesus. We want the new system to come. And others have said, no, no, not yet. I don't even know where my children are. Oh, that's a trial. But Job was saying, don't leave. Look at what the trial is going to do for you. Look how it's going to develop loyalty, confidence, and strength in me. It's like Jesus told Peter, when once you have returned, You'll be able to strengthen your brothers then. You'll know what it's like to be a real brother. So consider what the trial will do for us. It may, reveal, it may reveal flaws in us. We may have flaws in our personality. Maybe we are a little prideful. Maybe we are stubborn and a little impatient. Well, the trial helps us to see what we need to do. If we allow our emotions to dominate us, the result may prove to be more damaging than the trial itself. We get bent out of shape. You notice that? We're in the hands of the potter. Now we're bent out of shape. We're telling the potter, don't make me this way. How can the clay look up at the potter and say, well, don't make me this way. Look at what the trial does for us. Job is saying, just stay in my hands. Develop endurance. Rely on Holy Spirit. Learn to make the best of a bad situation. Like David. Like Joseph and others. Trials actually enlarge our experience. They help us to show more empathy. To show more understanding. We're able to help others in similar circumstances. By permitting the trial to run its course without resorting to something unscriptural to bring it to a swift end, we're refined, we're shaped, and we're molded by Jehovah. So don't throw away the trial. Consider it a joy when you meet with various trials. Why one couple, every time they had to endure something, they would always say, I don't know what Jehovah's training us for, but he's training us for something. And once they endured, years later, 
they say, you know, that's what this was all about. And here comes another trial. We say, well, we don't know what Job is training us for, but he's training us for something. And years later, they say, that's what this is all about. Many of you have endured things that it will shame a common criminal. You've endured. And now look at your strength. Look at your fiber. You know, young people, we always look at the circuit overseer and that, that's what, what we say when we're young. Well, what do you want to be when you grow up? Well, I want to be a circuit overseer. You probably couldn't endure half the things Brother and Sister Prifty have already endured. We look at them now and say, oh, look at them. Isn't it so nice to be in the circuit work? You probably can't carry what they've endured. You might have wanted to give up a long time ago. But Jehovah said, now I can use them. They've stayed in my hands. So allow the trial to shape us. Just rely on Holy Spirit. If you feel overwhelmed at times, then pray for Holy Spirit and let it work. Supplicate God. Talk to God and pray to him. No, Jesus told his followers, when you pray, you better go in your closet. He said, some of the things you need to pray about, if someone heard it, you'd scare them to death. <laughs> One member of the governing body said, life is real. Our problems are real. And therefore, our prayers must be real. Have you ever felt that Jehovah left you? Have you ever felt that things were so bad that the only way that this could happen to you, Jehovah must have left. You ever felt that way? And then you say, well, I, I know I'm not supposed to pray, uh, feel that way, so I, I better pray about it. And now you don't even know what to pray about. You can't get the words out. You just kind of close your eyes. You open them again. And you, you try to close your eyes, you know, kind of concentrate, get a headache. But you can't come up with it. Well, the Bible says, pray under the influence of Holy Spirit. That's what it means to pray with Holy Spirit. That means pray under its influence. Well, look at what the Bible tells us in the book of Romans chapter 8. Let's all turn there together. In Romans chapter 8, it's really a comforting scripture. If we could only keep it in mind. Here in the Bible in Romans chapter 8, verse 26 and 27. The Bible says, in like manner, the spirit also joins in with help for our weakness. For the problem of what we should pray for as we need to do, we do not know. But the spirit itself pleads for us with groanings unuttered. Yet he who searches the heart knows what the meaning of the spirit is. Because it is pleading in accord with God for holy ones. You see what Jehovah's telling us? There are going to be times that you don't know what to say. You don't know what to pray for. The Bible says, don't worry, Holy Spirit. There are groanings that are unuttered. You haven't even said it yet. You can't come up with the words before Jehovah. But talk to God about it. Pray under the influence of Holy Spirit. Jehovah knows what we really need. No human can do for you what God can do. You could never do for yourself what Jehovah is able to do. So allow him to use his tool. So heed the admonition to pray under the influence of Holy Spirit. Remember, when we say we're in the hands of the great potter, as, as Jeremiah said, Jehovah, we're the clay and you're the potter. As Isaiah helped us to appreciate, it's, it's in Jehovah's hands where we want to be. We're not talking about a massage. We're talking about a deep molding. There's going to be a lot of effect here. When we pray with Holy Spirit, it reflects the proper heart condition. Otherwise, we may grieve the Spirit if we don't show the proper heart condition. Holy Spirit helps us to make room for qualities that we actually need. 
There have been certain things that we've had to endure, and years ago, we, we, we would have never endured it. You ever had someone do something unkind to you, and you, you don't do the same thing to them? Maybe you wouldn't have done that years ago. One sister told me, she said, brother, years ago, you wouldn't have been able to stand next to me. She said, I carried a gun. I said, now, you carried a gun. Were, were you baptized? She said, yeah, the brothers didn't know it. <laughs> She's not that way anymore. I've never searched her down or anything, but she doesn't seem to be that way. She's relying on the Holy Spirit. She's a very kind sister. Others are able to show compassion now. Others are able to show forgiveness. Why do we have trials? They have a work to do. They produce in us endurance. They produce in us qualities and fiber that we need. Let Jehovah work it out. Jehovah said, let me work it out. Don't tell me how to make you, just let me work it out. Who knows better for us than Jehovah? So let him mold us. We can be turned into vessels for an honorable purpose. And as the Bible says, useful. Yes, useful to its owner. Let's look at the third way that Jehovah can mold us. His organization. It's discipline and training by means of God's organization. It helps to mold us. It helps to shape us. That training we get from Jehovah. We receive instruction and discipline through Jehovah's organization. Have you ever heard a talk at a meeting and it sounded as though the brother was talking exactly to you? He was so much on target, you felt he is talking exactly about me. It's gotten to the point that you had to go up to one of the elders and say, uh, that was an interesting talk we had today, wasn't it? <laughs> now, what you really mean is, did you talk to him about me? <laughs> well, no, he didn't. But that's how Jehovah molds us. That's how he trains us, by means of his organization. The spiritual food from the faithful and discreet slave. The Watchtower study, true or false, it's one of the principal means that God uses to feed the organization. That's false. It is the principal means. Do you study the Watchtower? Now, we're the best underliners and highlighters in the world. <laughs> we can underline and highlight on a packed subway train. It's late at night on Saturday. We say, oh, I got to get my lesson. So we go and highlight and underline so we can have a comment to sound like we're deep. You're not deep. You don't even know the direction the slave is taking. Do you work along with the faithful and discreet slave in God's organization? Do you cherish, do you hang on every word, every paragraph, every scripture from the Watchtower study? The brothers are not throwing darts. A lot of thought, a lot of attention, a lot of prayer have gone into these articles. And now the slave is saying, let's stay in the hands of the potter. The slave said, we're going to take it up a notch. We're going to have a magazine for you. And we're going to have a magazine for them. Some don't even realize what's going on. The slave said, we're going to take it up a notch. We're in the last days of a wicked and a dying system. And the only way we're going to survive is to be molded by the potter. Jehovah's using his organization today to shape us, to form us, to fashion us. So that's how we receive instruction. Specific talks. Why, just last month in our Watchtower discussion, we discussed Romans chapter 12 and verse 17. Everybody remember that? That was the one, return evil for evil to no one. Wasn't that some article? And some raised their hand and they said, well, brother, this means that now that we understand this, we will no longer retaliate. Be for real. <laughs> we learned in that article that tit for tat behavior is not limited to kids play. It's an urge. Remember the Watchtower said it's deep seated to retaliate. We need those reminders over and over again. We finished the lesson and we went out and retaliated. 
You can't just uh, make changes overnight. The hearts have to be put in tune. Minds have to be changed. It doesn't happen just that way. We're not talking about a massage. We're talking about a molding, a shaping, a refining. Jehovah's shaving us down. He wants us to live. So by means of his organization, the meetings, the publications of the faithful and discreet slave. And we need our meetings, don't we? We need those reminders. A meeting misses a blessing miss. Why a meeting misses a blessing miss? There are things said at meetings never be said that way again. There are comments made at meetings never be uttered that way again. If we missed a meeting, we missed a blessing. But we get training, we get disciplined by means of our Heavenly Father through his organization. So self-discipline is needed to attend meetings regularly. Programs at assemblies and conventions, they shape us. Be encouraging to the young ones. You know, when I walked in here today, I stopped two young men. They were some good-looking young men. I said, brothers, what's your name? They gave me their names. And I said, uh, now what congregation are you in? They gave me the name of their congregation. I said, well, how is it in school? Is, is it real bad in school? One said, well, it just started. <laughs> he kind of looked at me like, don't you know, it just started. <laughs> you look at these young people here, fine young people, good looking young people, young brothers and young sisters. But do you know what's taking place in their school? Do you know what's happening in the hallways? Do you know what's taking place in the back of the class? By means of God's organization, they're being trained, they're being molded, but, but be encouraging to the young ones. Young ones, we don't always get it right. We don't always understand. Be patient with us. We're trying. We're trying to help you to stay in the hands of the great potter. So young ones, stay with us. Stay with God's organization. Receive his molding and his training. And allow Jehovah to help you as he works through your parents. Actually, training is beneficial. It's not all bad. It's not all painful. Jehovah's trying to help all of us, young and old, to stay in his hands. Now, notice some examples of what happens when we allow ourselves to be molded or trained by Jehovah. Now, some have felt that they would never give a public witness. Maybe you said that yourself. You ever meet someone that says, well, I appreciate the work that you all do and the truth that you do, but this business about going door to door, now I'm never going to do that. And now we can't hold them back. Some are pioneering. Some are calling us early in the morning, knocking on our doors. We're telling them, well, you go home. I'm not going out in service today. But we can't hold them back. Through the discipline and the training of Jehovah's organization, he's, he's made them different people. So yes, that's how he molds us, by means of his organization. Now there were some that felt they would never give a public talk. They felt they would never speak publicly. One brother, when he gave his first talk, he fainted. Got up on the platform, they gave his name, and he passed out. <laughs> he wound up a member of the governing body. He gave talks all over the world. Brother John Booth. He was in the hands of the potter. And that's what has happened to many of us. Some have been very negative about making comments at meetings. It's a phobia. They want to, but they can't get their hand up. The brother brings the microphone towards them. They start hemorrhaging and can swallow and everything. They say, move the microphone from me. <laughs> but somehow we've learned to, we've learned to get our hand up and to say something. That's training through Jehovah's organization. The comment is not only good for you, but it's good for us. We're hanging on every word. Haven't we all heard comments or interviews, people we didn't even know them personally, but we'll never forget it. It changed our lives. That's all a part of the molding process in Jehovah's organization. And remember, Jehovah's not unrighteous so as to forget our work. He's not unrighteous so as to forget our work. In order to forget it, that means you have to know it first. So Job has taken note of everything you've done. 
He sees it. Everything that you do. And the Bible says he won't forget it. He took notice of it at the beginning. And he won't forget it. So by means of his organization. All the work that we have to do within. That's how Jehovah trains us. Yes, that's, that's how he molds us. Think about our recent district convention. Maybe circuit assemblies that you've had. The district convention. Remember what the audio drama did for us? Everybody wanted to know, what is that all about? The audio drama. Well, what's that all about? Well, now we know. They train us. They help us to see, you know, maybe I need to meditate more when I read. I hear the sound of the water and the boats. Feel the breeze out there on the boat. They're training us. They're telling us, get into the word. Get into the word. This is a visual age. But people that fear God, that love God, they meditate. The Bible says we're bringing every thought into captivity. Helen Keller, she couldn't see, nor could she hear, but she had thoughts. They want us to meditate. That's how they're training us today. That's how they're shaping us today. Our district convention had told us something, didn't it? It says, follow the Christ. It made it very simple. It just said, just, just be like Christ. One brother received an additional privilege. He was appointed as a presiding overseer of a congregation. And uh, he was very conscientious about this privilege. And he wanted to be the best possible presiding overseer he could be. So you know what he did? He started talking to different brothers that he knew that served in that position, or maybe they had served in that position. He talked to many that had been in the traveling work, many that are presiding overseers, many had presided for many, many years. And they all gave him some nice suggestions. Finally, he talked to one brother, and one brother looked at him and said, I don't see what the big deal is. All you got to do is be like Christ. <laughs> he said, I don't see why you're making this such a big thing. Just be like Christ. Wouldn't you like to have a presiding overseer like Christ? And that's what the convention told us. Whatever you're going to do, just follow the Christ. Just be like Christ. And for those that aren't Christ, you need to know you're not Christ. But we're trying to be like him. You know, some will say, though, that's, that's good. But I'm dealing with men. You don't know the men that I'm dealing with. You don't know the people that I have to deal with. The trials that they put upon us. The things that we have to undergo. Some will say that quickly. They say, oh, I can point it out to you what they're doing. Well, Jehovah wants us to be obedient. Jehovah's dealing with loyal men, not perfect men. Jehovah said they're loyal. They're not going to get it all right. You don't have to point it out. Jehovah said, I see it myself. But they're loyal men. I never told you they'd be perfect. That's part of the molding process. Jehovah can bless any decision that imperfect men make. He can bless any decision that loyal servants of his make. But he never blesses disobedience. By means of his organization, he molds us if we can just be obedient. Could you turn with me in the Bible to the book of 1 Kings? 1 Kings chapter 3. An interesting uh, biblical account. We're really dealing with the life of uh, King Solomon. But in 1 Kings chapter 3, let's look at verse 5. Yes, 1 Kings chapter 3 and verse 5. The Bible tells us in Gibeon, Jehovah appeared to Solomon in a dream by night. And God proceeded to say, request what I should give you. Why, what would you say if Jehovah came to you in a dream? When your inhibitions are low, what would you request? What would you ask for? Would you say, Jehovah, a million dollars would be good? The Bible says he went to Solomon in a dream, and what did he ask for? Look at verse 9. Solomon said, and you must give to your servant an obedient heart to judge your people, to discern between good and bad. For who is able to judge this difficult people of yours? That's what Jehovah's looking for. He wants us to be obedient. Could you turn to Romans chapter 16? Here in the Bible, in the book of Romans, in Romans chapter 16. 
This too underscores what Jehovah is interested in today. There in the Bible, the book of Romans chapter 16, look at verse 19. For your obedience has come to the notice of all. I therefore rejoice over you, but I want you to be wise as to what is good, but innocent as to what is evil. So Jehovah tells us our obedience, it's noticed. By being obedient to the organization, organization arrangement, that's how Jehovah molds us. Someone has to be in charge. Is it all bad simply because it's not you? It's an organization that Jehovah's using. Someone has to be in charge. Mistakes will be made. You know, you're going to be disappointed by people in responsible position. It's going to happen. It may be personal, but don't take it personal. It may be personal, but don't take it personal. View it from the viewpoint of God, from God's standpoint. Stay in the hands of Jehovah. Look at 1 Thessalonians, what the Bible tells us here as well. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We want to look at verse 12 and verse 13. Here in the Bible, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Notice verse 12 and verse 13. Now we request you, brothers, to have regard for those who are working hard among you and presiding over you in the Lord and admonishing you. Verse 13. And to give them more than extraordinary consideration and love because of their work. Be peaceable with one another. Well, that's the admonition from Jehovah. Let's face it. Elders, they must give instruction. Do we consider their instruction as coming from Jehovah? Now, all of us, we're quick to admit that we're imperfect. Isn't that easy to say? Well, after all, I'm imperfect. And we'll tell someone real quick, well, you know, I'm not perfect. We'll yell that from the housetops. Well, I'm not perfect, but don't let them point out some specific we've done. Now that changes things. We're quick to admit that we're imperfect. But let someone point out something that we as an imperfect person has done. Now we're saying, well, now you're getting personal. Well, it is personal. You're imperfect. And it's going to be pointed out. It's going to come to light. So work with the elders. Be quick to respond to counsel. If you have a problem with living up to Bible standards, get it straight now. Go and talk to the elders. Seek their help. You want to deal with men before you have to deal with angels. You see, the angels will weed you out. It's all a part of the training process. It's what Jehovah is using today. To train his people. Will you let the great potter. Mold you for trials ahead. Will you stay in Jehovah's hands. As weak and as imperfect as we are. Will you allow him to train you. For future trials. We're getting ready to face the attack of Gog of Magog. It's hard for us to sit there and imagine. What we're going to have to go through. We're getting ready to face the attack of Gog of Magog. It's hard to sit there and picture what's going to take place when Satan, the devil, and the demons are after us. You know your boss at work that's pretty favorable about what you do and the work that you do? He's going to be against you. You know your neighbor lives down the street that's uh, pretty favorable about what you do and pretty cordial toward you and your family? Well, well, they're going to be against you. And you know your family, they don't share the same belief that you share, but they respect you and they try to be supportive. Well, they're going to be against you. We're getting ready to face the attack of Gog of Magog. It's going to take every bit of strength that we can muster. And the only way we're going to survive is if we've been molded by Jehovah. That's why he's saying, I love you. You're going to be useful to me. But just stay in my hand. Certain qualities are essential if we're going to continue. If we're going to continue to allow ourselves to be molded, if we're going to continue to submit to Jehovah as vessels of honor, then we need certain qualities. One is humility. Humility is necessary as Jehovah trains us for trials ahead. And it's so interesting. Humility 
is not a fruitage of God's spirit, but it is a requirement in order to receive it. It's a prerequisite in order to receive Holy Spirit. We must be humble. Jehovah can't use proud people. And it's loving on Jehovah's part. Jehovah says, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. He knows how hard it is for us to be humble. He says, you know what I'm going to do? I love you so much. I'm going to let you humble yourself. Jehovah says, you don't want me to humble you. Why have I humble you? There might not be anything left. So he's saying, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. Endurance is another quality. We need to endure. You ever notice that some people can't endure anything? Oh, they can walk tall. They can make comments. They can look like a prime and pristine Christian. But let them have to endure something. They're yelling from the housetops, kicking over chairs, spitting water on people. They can't endure. They want to tell you right away, I've been mistreated. I need to let you know. Well, get in line like everybody else. We've all been mistreated. But can you endure? Can you work with God? You know, a baby can easily tear it down. It takes a skilled architect, a builder, and a designer to build it. Which one are you? Can you endure things? Love is an essential quality. What happened to love nowadays? We need love because it prompts willing obedience. It moves people to respond to God's direction. You know, home is not always where you live. It's where you feel understood. That's why the bars are so full. Remember the situation comedy? They said a place where everyone knows your name. They don't want to go home because they don't feel loved. Love is an essential quality in your household. It's an essential quality in your congregation. Love is a quality that's needed. Jehovah's teaching us. To show love. You remember what David said in the 51st Psalm? Now let's turn there together. And Psalm 51, here's what the psalmist David had to say. In the 51st Psalm in verse 17, David is mentioning, he said, The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a heart broken and crushed, O God. You will not despise. David is telling Jehovah. He said, Jehovah, if you have to, start all over with me. J just start all over. If I'm not good enough, I want you to mold me. Sometimes the pottery becomes hardened. It's not quite what the potter wanted. He has to crush it. Bring it down to base powder. And David is telling Jehovah, if that's what you need to do, start all over with me. But I want to be useful to you in your hands. And during this molding process, Jehovah tells us, I'm not going to let anything come upon you that you cannot bear. He said, but along with it, I'm going to make the way out. So stay in the hands of the potter, brothers and sisters. Work with Jehovah. Don't rely on ourselves and our own strength. Don't become overconfident, but just, just stay in Jehovah's hands. The Bible spoke of the man Moses. It said he was powerful in both word and deed. In fact, he was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. Well, Moses had some awful fine qualities. He was overconfident, though. He wanted to free the people. He went out and he killed a man. Jehovah says, oh, I'm going to free the people. But when I free the people, I'm going to get the glory, not someone else. Jehovah told Moses, well, you have some qualities. You don't have the ones you need. You have more ability than you have qualities. He had him out there with sheep in the desert for some 40 years. Jehovah shaped him. Jehovah molded him. He took Moses and he kept him in his hands. He did him like, mm, 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 mm. When he finished with Moses, Moses said, can Aaron go with me because I can't talk? Jehovah said, now you're ready. He says, now you're ready. You had all the wisdom of the Egyptians. You were powerful in both word and deed, but you didn't have the qualities. The great potter said, just stay in my hands. Just let me work with you. Let me shape you. And Moses was a useful vessel to Jehovah God. Brothers and sisters, stay in the hands of the great potter. 
for those of us that love God, for those of us that fear God, be molded by the great potter.